Okay. <sighs> I hope that's straight, because <laughs> I can't see. But I just wanted to share with you guys. Um, I'm cooking my, or fixing my husband his meal. So I want to share the recipe. Can um, smudge you. Please. I should have brought my feather, but that's okay. Can you do it? Yeah. Okay. Come here with you so I can smudge you. Okay, smudge yourself. You know how. Hold your head. Up on you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, basically, what I'm doing for those that don't know me or, or don't know what's going on in my life, um, my my husband is battling throat cancer and the radiation has damaged some muscles in his um, throat so he can't swallow food and he's been choking on it and aspirating it. So um, they installed a, a, a feeding tube in his stomach. So I'm the one that um, feeds him basically. I decide and I cook and I blend and I but I do everything I can to try to put some weight on him. And now this one here I'm going to do, I'm going to put some bran in there and some raisins because um, <laughs> I need, I, I have him, I want him to do a doo-doo. <laughs> okay, so um, first thing I'm do is Wash my hands really good with hot water. So basically, I gotta make him um, his dinner. So I'm gonna uh, use the blender and the Cuisinart because I'm gonna use put bran, uh, and the only kind of bran I have is bran flakes, and I put raisins in it. <laughs> so these have to be chopped up. And if I chop them up with the uh, blender, there'll be some big and some small. I have to, uh, uh, I have to. Uh, okay. See, what I did was I steamed the, uh, I don't know if you can see it. I steamed the raisin bran with the raisins or the bran flakes. Um, basically, he, and, and this is the stuff that they give him to, uh, that I put in, but it only has 100 calories and um, he needs to gain some weight and he needs some strength. So, uh, he can have any kind of food through the tube that he had through his mouth. 
but you know it just has to be um I puree it and then I um sift it. Alright. Okay. I'll put this other away and or maybe later I'll after I rest a little bit I'll um uh, I'll make it now so and put it in the baggies. Um I grew up in a big family, so <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is or how hard I try, everything I make, it always ends up <laughs> um, being a lot. Everybody says, well, who are you cooking for? So I take it around to the building here. I know there's a lot of people, or, you know, and bachelors, you know, people that are just kind of living by themselves. Um, this is cherry juice, Bing cherry juice. Um, I'm hoping that will um, give him a kick to make him start <laughs> pooping. <laughs> this Cuisinart, art, okay, it's gonna be kind of loud. This little cuisine art is the best kitchen tool I've ever had. You can chop up anything in there. But it doesn't chop it as fine as the um the blender does. Someday I'll learn how to do things and not make a mess. Probably won't taste good, but someday. <laughs> Basically, I grew up really poor. Uh, and, you know, after my mom had to leave because my dad was half beaten or to death every day. Then it was me and I was taking care of three younger brothers. And we had a stepmother and they had, but first we had this big, um, big routine of foster homes. Oh God. Some are maybe good, but not the ones that we got. <laughs> okay, this is going to be a little bit loud. <laughs> saved us in the foster homes was my mom taught me how to how to cook and clean and everything that you know a lot of people don't learn anymore she even um took me to work with her when you know she did housekeeping for some of the um wealthier people around phoenix um uh, she oh this is the um it says complete balanced nutrition, 1.2 cal. Huh. If I gave him enough that he would start gaining weight, I'd be sitting there shoving it in there all the time. So I do things, put things in the blender that I think will help him and make, you know, get him healthy. And I must be. Um, doing it right because he's putting on weight and uh, I was kind of worried because his breathing was acting funny uh, when I took him to the emergency room the other night and um, when I was changing the bandages on his um, is this a limb? <laughs> on his uh, tube that comes out of his stomach there's a valve on the end where you see them and I use these um these are big syringes 
that I seal up and I hook it to that tube and I seal, see him and then I seal it up again and I I give him a lot of water because I, I he has a problem with being dehydrated so I, I basically I do everything I can think of to help him get better. <laughs> water um i boil the water that i put in the tube or given because um they said it's okay to use tap water but this old building is from the 60s and it's got the same plumbing and there's probably all kinds of moss and monsters and everything growing there so you know i even though they say i don't need to I boil it. I don't sterilize everything anymore because I, everybody kept telling me don't sterilize everything. But I do do everything I can to make sure that it's as clean as possible. With And I do sterilize it if I want to. Um, if anybody knows me, they know um, if I say something, there's no use arguing with me because I'm going to win. I'm not going to quit until you hear me or whatever because I know what I'm talking about. Um, people try to treat me like I'm a, a hang around the fort kind of Indian sat and waited for their check. You know, everybody puts Indians off like that, natives. I lived through racism my whole life, but I got through it, you know, and I can tell you how, but right now I am going to share with you what cancer does cancer is no joke <laughs> Jim loves to eat. He's always loved to eat. Um, and he loved my cooking. You know, and I, lo I loved cooking for him. Um, But cancer took his ability to taste and eat and enjoy food. It's gone now. <sighs> so I make things to, that I think will help him you know, build strength, you know, um, a lot of protein for his muscles make sure that he has water a lot uh, I do everything I can to help him fight you know um, because of his age he's 77 man he's sharp as a tack for 77 and he's healthy but the thing that hurt him was Smoking, smoking for 50 years, and towards the end, it was those little cigars. So, when I met him and I got, made him go to the doctor and stuff, and uh, they did tests and they found a cancer right away. <laughs> but it was, 
we caught it really early. So what they did was, um, and it was only in one lung, we caught it when it was just now forming. It wasn't even a tumor yet. The cells were just changing. So um, they operated on his lung and they took about a quarter size off his lung. But he came through it real good. The thing is that they say they worry about is um, his COPD. You know, they can't operate uh, and take any cancer out of his lungs because um, it might not, they might not be able to fill it, you know, to get it to fill back up again. That would be, <laughs> but um, he's had it two more times since then. Uh, basically the same kind of cancer and all they did was give him four, four radiation treatments. That's it. And then, um, then they scan every three months and watch him. And then it came back again. So they get, um, gave him four radiation treatments. And he was in remission this time for, how long, Jim? Mm -hmm. How long were you in remission before this cancer? Oh, um. About three years, huh? Yeah. yeah, he was in remission for about three years, but they they scanned all the time. So, you know, they found it, but this one, they, um, the radiologist, they found it, but it, it was in a different area and it wasn't, um, shaped and everything like the other one. So they said, um, that they don't think it's cancer, uh, so they're just gonna uh, let it go and watch it. <laughs> so three months later, they do the scan, and that cancer that was, oh shoot, I overfilled it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when they say that happens, that. <laughs> There's somebody, the spirit, that was hungry and wanted some, so it's okay. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the scan showed something, but they didn't tell, say it. They just said they wanted a conference, and at the time of that conference, I was here flat on my back with vertigo. I don't know where and how it came from, but I have an idea. Um... I was hit on the side of the head <laughs> uh, by a cop with one of those big, um, those great big flashlights they carry. <laughs> they all beat the hell out of me, but I'm not going to go into that right now. <laughs> it was because they were beating up my brother, and I slipped out the handcuffs and I hit the cop that was beating that. He grabbed the back of my brother's head. They were arresting him. And they grabbed the back of his handcuff, leaning over the hood. And um, I don't know if he said something or what, but he looked up at the, at the officer. And he just grabbed the back of my brother's head and just slammed his face into that car hood. Oh, hell no. Not my little brother. So I slipped out of the handcuffs they had me in, and I come right up. Boy, I got that cop that hit him right under the jaw, man. He wasn't expecting it. <laughs> uh, so I got him good. I knocked him on his ass. That was the best feeling I ever had. You know, because this guy was hurting my little brother. <laughs> and that's the way these cops are in Billings, Montana. Um, how did they expect you to have respect and, um, all this stuff for these cops when they're just like a Gestapo? I mean, there's a lot of things in Gibbons, Montana, man. That was redneck city. As soon as, well, what happened is we were at a party and it was out of city limits of Gibbons. And my brother, um... He was just separated from his wife. They had two daughters. And people that were around told him that um, 
her new boyfriend was um was hitting the little one the littlest daughter too hard because um she wouldn't she wouldn't listen so he showed up at that party you know that big party you know how natives are um hmm oh i gotta grab a bag but um here comes that guy and my brother Called him up. Uh, we don't have any more sa little sandwich bags, Jim. Oh. Where's those little sandwich bags? Oh, they're over here. Oh, that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll put, I'll put it away later. What I do is I take this extra, and I put a serving in these um, Ziploc bags, and I freeze them. And when he's going to eat them, be a uh, few hours before I do. I set them in, in warm water and let them thaw like that because you can't get it, you can't get it hot and you can't get it cold. So, you know, everything has to be. And then what I do is I pull up two syringes of water and I connect it to the tube and I put it in that, uh, to flush the tube and then I pull in the food and I just keep putting that in until the food's gone or if it's hard to push, you know, then if I know he's getting full, then I stop and I give him two more big tubes of water. And um, sometimes, you know, if, it, if he's okay with it, I'll give him even more water. You know, I want him hydrated. I want, I want him to live, so I do everything I can. Man, cancer is a uh, MH. <laughs> uh, no, wait. M F. See, that's how bad I am. You know, I, in some of the um, things and in some of the posts, I can say some uh, things that would make a drunken sailor blush you know but I was an iron worker you know I worked I did I walked high iron I was a structural iron worker and I was a certified welder in the union in Minneapolis you know but I didn't want to die die for it and then they started cutting me down and they took most of my money in taxes and you know, I was a structural, I was a welder. A lot of times I had to weld um, on the perimeter, you know, welding a um, post for the safety line that goes around. And you're walking on nothing. You're walking, you know, there's a lot of times I put my life on the line. You know, but I did my job. I wasn't no to token iron worker. I was an iron worker and I could do my job. But, um... I started having panic attacks, and then I fell, but I didn't fall my safety line because I tied off. But anyway, um, from there I went to work for uh, <laughs> the Beast Indian Bar in Minneapolis, right on Franklin Avenue. Um, there used to be the corral, but they tore that down, but I was a bartender in Mr. Arthur's. I started out a waitress, and then they moved me to bartender in a week. And then I, I couldn't get past these panic attacks. So from there I went to working at, I worked at a, um, a tailor shop where they worked with making like bridal gowns and altering real expensive suits, you know, I had, and from there, um, one of the women that came in asked me if I would come and work for her and I could manage her shop. And that was a good idea. I mean, I went for it. But the panic attacks, you know, what happened? Um, and they do this so much. When I was about 26, 25 to 26, I got so depressed. You know, I gave my kids up for adoption. I knew, 
I had to get him out of that cycle of drunks. And when I walked in to the living room from the kitchen and I see my three and a half year old slam a shot of vodka, he just took it, slammed it, and then hit it on the table and looked at me and didn't even make a face. And then he held the glass up and he said, Jink, Jink, Ma, Jink. Oh, God, I went nuts. I chased him out and I rushed him to the hospital and um, the next day I couldn't get them away. My mom, my uncles, everybody was always there and they were always drunk. And one of my uncles I found out was the one that started giving vodka to my son. And then I went to clean up and I found behind the couch, behind all these chairs, I found empty cans of beer because my son was stealing them. I said, oh no, oh hell no. So I found a home and I gave him, I gave him to a better life. The mother was a principal of a high school and the dad was an established artist. So I gave them to her. But they haven't forgiven me. But if they, if I would have talk, taken them on the roller coaster ride that I lived on, I, they would be like me. Their lives were mirroring mine. Sometimes you have to love someone more than you love yourself. How can I teach them to be successful? How can I teach them to do anything when I didn't know? All I knew was alcoholics, fighting off drunk men that are trying to molest me, fighting off family members that are trying to molest me, hiding under beds and closets. And I mean, I was a little bony thing. I used to fold myself up and I got, I hid it in one of those white whisk, wicker laundry baskets. I mean, just to escape getting molested. So anyway, I ended up, they sent me to my mom in Montana. But that was a, <laughs> my grandpa was a minister and I was a, um, his prodigal granddaughter, no matter what I did. So I got married to get away from him and that was even worse, you know, but the best man I ever found is right here. And I better stop talking and, and go and feed him. But, you know, I just wanted to let you know the human side of cancer. I don't, I'm losing weight because I don't want to cook and not him, him not be able to eat it. And it's good that I'm losing weight, but I'm moving round the clock because this is my husband. I don't care when he says, you know, I give him the best care that I can and do everything I can to keep him alive because I need him. He's my life. I never had a man, I never had anybody my whole life that was loyal to me, stuck up for me, took me no matter what. I mean, Jim's been that for me. I had to have a lot of operations. I was um, held hostage by a, a gangster, a real one, a Rolling Twenties Crip in Long Beach. And the beatings and stuff that they did to me, he tortured me. I, when I, he, I escaped, I was on the street, but I was bleeding really heavily from the injuries and I just wanted to die. <laughs> And finally, I, I was close to it. <laughs> and the people that were on the street, they called the police on me. So they took me in. And here I woke up and I said, oh no, why? And then I, they were letting me go and I had no place to go. Nobody cared. I mean, <laughs> why didn't I, why didn't they let me die? So I met, Jim, you know, through a friend earlier, so I, I thought, well, I'm going to visit Jim and then I'll go down and see if I can get blankets and stuff to sleep outside. And then when I came in and 
I talked to Jim. He told me to stay here with him. <laughs> and I told him I don't have anything, and he said, that's okay. And he gave me everything. I mean, he gave me... He gave me unconditional love. <laughs> and I just get mad at Creator. <laughs> I went suffered my whole life going through everything and then he gives me that. <laughs> well, blame him because smoking did it. You know what? All of us are going to have cancer. Um, I got to go in on the 8th. They're going to do a, a mammogram, an ultrasound, and a biopsy at the same time. But I don't care. I mean, just the cancer, the doctor said that the cancer is going to take him. So they're doing, all they're doing right now is buying him time. So I do everything I can to get him more time to be with me. So anyway, <laughs> I got to go feed him and... If you watch this, it's a relatives, my heart.